Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. You loved our next guest in Westworld, Unsolved, Black Mirror, House of Cards. And if you're me, you loved Happ and Leonard as well as Under the Silver Lake. And now you can see Jimmy Simpson in the beautifully made new show, Perpetual Grace Limited. Let's take a look. Four million dollars. We should take that money. It'll be easy. Just a couple old people. Oh yeah, and, and you'd have to get hooked on methadone. For real. My parents can tell. After I count down three rounds in hell, I'll be in good company. We have a church where we treat men and women troubled such as you. You're gonna be okay. I see my redhead mess, bad tear shed, queen be my squeeze. It's a new day, boy. The state they stole all that money. This church, they're supposed to help people, but they use it to rip people off. I'm getting it back. Make things right. Let's stay the plan. They left last night. They're on their way. Come with me. It's not like we're hurting them. We just get them out of the picture for a little while. Then I'll be in good company. I am going to kill you, motherfucker. I am the pale horse of death, and hell follows me, boy. Prepare for the devil. I shall deliver you unto his fucking kingdom. Come. The guy who's supposed to be dead is running around. He just killed a 24-year-old kid with his shoe. Don't worry. I got a plan. So you're saying you want me to go to Mexico and do something important? Cool. Let's do it. I shot the sheriff and I slipped the noose. Twenty-six thousand dollars back, or I'm gonna get you. The law ain't never been a friend of mine. I've been looking for you for a long time now. I'm a wanted man. As a person of interest in the murder, you are obligated to an accounting of your whereabouts. Do you understand? I'm a wanted man. I am my own god. Thank you for this loving gift. This is getting out of control. My husband is a very powerful man, capable of kneeling and rising again. Get down here, get the fucking crazy old man. Where are you going, boys? I'm a wanted man. Do you understand? I'm a wanted man. Get it. Get the rhythm, get the rhythm, there you go, there you fucking go. Get the rhythm, get the rhythm, there you go, there you fucking go. Get the rhythm, get the rhythm, there you go, there you fucking go. Get the rhythm, get the rhythm. Are you feeling strong enough? Strong enough for what? Welcome the great Jimmy Simpson. The great. The great. Great is, a, is hyperbole. It's hyperbole. No, you're great. You know it. You're great. You're fun to have on for, as an interview, and you're a wonderful actor. You make great choices in terms of your acting. You're fun to well. be had on by. I'm fun. Oh, I, I like that. That thank was you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, for of a, course. A, a, you know, thumbs up on some choices. Because <laughs> when you make a choice, you never know. You never you know. Feel, do you feel like your choices have been, uh, have f by and large, been pretty good as well? Like, do you enjoy the content that you've mostly been a part of? I do. I do enjoy the content. Now, Content's such a bad word, excuse it's, me. But, but it's fitting. Yeah. It's apt, like you. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, for the, the first three quarters of my career thus far, choices were not my own, essentially. You know, it was, it was what things would come to me, and I would make the best of it, or I would, you know. But lately, I've been able to make some choices. And I, I do keep following my heart. I, I like a project. I like a writer. I like uh, a role that's going to be reflective of humanity or show something. I just like the craft of storytelling. And so I go wherever the good story is. What's the first thing that you look for? Well, writing. Um, um, I, my writer is, is my god. My director is also my god when doing a job. And uh, if... If the writing, I'm such an avid reader, if the writing is impressive, I'm instantly curious to see how the story will be told. And with Stephen Conrad for Perpetual Grace, I read the script and it was, it was other level. It was, it was the best script I'd read in so long, if not ever. 
And I just, I was like, well, how, how is he going to pull off this brilliance? And then I watched his show Patriot, and I saw he is one of the most filmically minded creators I've ever seen on television. When writing, when you say the writing in the script was, uh, was next level, is that the plot mechanics? Is that how he describes things? Is that the dialogue? Is that all of them mixed together? It's all of them together, which makes a great storyteller. Like, there's a lot of people strong with dialogue, a lot of people strong with describing action, a lot of sh people that are strong with, like, hitting a moment in the zeitgeist. But when you actually have someone who's so aware, so talented, and he and Bruce Terrace wrote the, the scripts, um, you, you just you have to follow them if, if you're in the craft of storytelling. You just have to, you know, be wherever they're going to go. And so now you go and meet him, right? Because you're interested now in yeah. doing it. And what are you looking for when you meet him? Is it, is it someone who is as strong as you thought he was based off of the script, but is also going to be a fun, nice collaborator? That's kind of huge to me, too. It's, it, you know, I, I'll work with a genius, um, if, even if they're, they're tough to get along with. But my hope, I mean, my, my biggest passion in life is is other humans and communication and relationships. And I, that's the foundation of, of what I need from this life. And so when uh, I'm dealing with a new person that I'll work for and I'll be doing what they want me to do for a prolonged period of time, gosh, I really hope it's gonna be a good human because you know, the showbiz is it's as capitalist as the next business. And sometimes there's just people out there trying to create content and, and be cool or like be famous and things. Steve Conrad would l hate it if he became recognizably famous. You know, he's <laughs> this shy, sweet man who loves his family and his brothers and um, he instantly blew me away that he had such a soft, accessible heart after being such a just clear as hell writer. Why does that blow you away? Are those two contradictory in nature to you? Not in nature to me, but just in, again, in, in the business, there's, uh, it's rare that you find a like-minded person. It's rare that you find someone that you'd be like, I want to hang out with them, not at work. It's very easy to find people you want to collaborate with and you want to work with them again. But when you meet someone like Stephen Conrad, who you just want to have him over for tea, and just talk and like find out how he's feeling. That's so rare. It's also so hard to make a show like this, one that is yeah. uncompromised mm -hmm. in really any way. It takes a fighter in a lot of ways to do that. And sometimes those fight, what is contradictory in nature is being able to be that kind of fighter, but also being able to be a soft, open human to your collaborators. I, I could not have said it better and I'm glad I didn't because that was beautiful and eloquent, um, but, but that's, that's exactly right. Sometimes there's a tight-fisted element to that kind of person who is so brilliant that they know this is the way it has to work, mm -hmm. and Steve is that with his art, but he's so wide open, so wide open with his soul. And then with each uh, department, he respects his costume department, the acting department. He respects us just as much as he respects himself, if not more even though he should respect himself more than us because he's so wickedly talented, but he, he makes us feel like we are the stars of his show. And I don't mean the actors' stars. I mean all elements, all designer elements. He makes them feel like they're the star of the show so that they can practice their craft, whether it's set design, costumes, makeup, whatever it is, he's going to support that element. And how does that work for you as an actor? Like you get into a scene and how do, it's all written, it's very clear in the writing. How do you bring yourself to it and bring yourself to a point where you feel like you are not just reading his words but are collaborating on his words as well? Well, preparation. I mean, uh, well, basically the fear of sucking propels me uh, so much in my life. I just, I just don't want to suck. And so... Can I ask, is that... Does that have a reference point for you? A moment where you have sucked and you think about that as like a reoccurring nightmare and to never go back there? It, it's not that. What it is is um, always, you know, I got into this, this craft kind of late. And so I always kind of felt out of place. Um, late how? How, how? how old were you when it you It was got halfway through college. Um, I, I was going to get a business and English degree. And then um, uh, my professor, uh, professor, the acting professor, I took an uh, acting course for an elective. And 
an acting professor saw something in me and she said, why don't you add this to your majors? And so I, I didn't, I've never wanted to be famous, I've never wanted to be up on stage, but when I found the craft of acting, it, it moved me uh, and like nothing had before that I could see potentially doing for my lifetime. There's also nothing like a professional or a teacher telling you you have something there. Like you should yeah. pursue this. I'm sure you probably did never experience I'd that never before. Been, I've never experienced that not just from a teacher, but just from anyone. That was literally <laughs> the first warm invite I had gotten. And so <laughs> and so I, I jumped in. But that that effect of like, okay, so I was the last one in the department and then I went and did some theater apprenticeships and you know, I was kind of you know skinny, funny looking guy and I was comfortable with that and so I was always surprised that people would want to see that on screen and so I'm like well if they're putting me up there I want to make sure I'm the best you know weirdo possible that they want to show up for two days and, and work on this thing you've always been so good at and you're not necessarily a weirdo in this at least off the bat yeah. but you've always been so good at playing the weirdo but never in a way that was over the top or like you were trying so desperately hard to look like a weirdo how did you how have you sort of modulated that over the course of, of your career well I think it's just the, first of all, being inherently weird right. and having people kind of... I think of like Happen Leonard, right? The character sure. in Happen Leonard, who's a stone psycho. Mm -hmm. He's into, uh, I don't want to say abnormal, definitely not abnormal, but like um, interesting sexual practices as so well. abnormal, right? he's, yeah. he's, he's fair, He nailed he's, a woman's hand to the table. Right, he's yeah. sadistic <laughs> for pleasure in a lot of ways, in most ways. See, that's, there you go, that's the difference. Uh, I saw that as... It, you can play, see guys who look kind of hot from the get-go, they think, oh, to play someone like that, I have to be creepy and weird, and I, and I have to kind of turn the screws too much, and it's too much. For me, uh, you have to figure out why he's doing those things. Why did he nail the girl's hand to the table? Why is he coming doing these sadistic things? He's trying to make the love of his life happy. And so if that's the thrust for each one of those actions, you're not going to see a guy who enjoys it. You're going to see a guy who's doing something to achieve kind of a, to him, a beautiful outcome, which is that his girl's going to love him even more. So he's seeking validation. Yeah, from, from one person, from the love of his life, which is a powerful, powerful validation to, to be trying to go for. And so that's how you play all these things. You play them as it's, it's a means to an end. It's not for the act. If you start playing the act, it's going to come off overwrought, I think. Do you feel like since then you've moved into, for lack of a better way to put it, leading man territory, where you are playing not necessarily creepy or sadistic or things that are uh, would mostly be considered sort of supporting style parts, but are mainly just sort of like the anchor for the story? I think with this, and I think even with Westworld sure. a little bit, you were. How, how, do you, how do you handle that, where at that point you the subtlety that you're bringing to a creep doesn't necessarily work because the character is already operating in a subtle way. Does that make sense, what I'm asking? A thousand percent. Yeah. It makes so much sense because it was such a, a um, kind of professional um, epiphany that, that was given to me from being asked to join Westworld. I had gotten really familiar with the world of jumping in and kind of spicing up the soup of a story, you know, I'd come on, I would be weird, and I, uh, you know, there's a certain comfort zone with like, I know this world, and I'm never gonna play anything the same, but I, I, I know what it's like to kind of move through a, a, a story and, and make it more exciting for a second, or more creepy for a second, and then exit. I had no experience of building kind of the audience perspective, yeah. possibly, in, in Westworld being that person that people can most relate to and that they can experience the story through you. Um, and I was stunned that they uh, asked me to play the part after I auditioned. Um, and I took it so seriously and I, I worked even harder than I had been working prior to that. And I, uh, I would just go to set early. I would spend as much time with the other actors who were all better than me as possible. <laughs> And I would, I, would, I would ask for like uh, preparation tips. And I was just so wide open that um, I was able to, to pull together in my own head an idea that I can do this. Um, but it, it, was all, it was all Westworld making me feel like um, 
I have the potential to be that narrative through line um, and it doesn't need to be like poppy. Mm -hmm. It needs to be even more honest than my creepy guys, you know, nailing hands to the table for love. There's a, there's a simplicity that was like a whole nother level of the craft to me. How do you find that, that honesty? I mean, let's talk about with Perpetual sure. Grace Limited. How do you find that honesty? I mean, especially in that opening scene, right, where you're basically hearing what the narrative is going to become, and you are the audience's perspective in, in that case. You are our gateway. How do you find the honest, honesty in those very, very small moments? Well, you need to be, uh, the show needs to be run by a filmmaker. You know, if television, there's a, there's a schedule. There's a hard, hard schedule. We have this much time, and it's all budget related, and so we have to get it done like this. And unless you have a really, really strong filmmaker at the helm, you're going to be pushed by producers, whoever it is, to just, just do it. Just tape it and move on. Just right. get the scene. With Steve Conrad, he, he, do, he doesn't believe television needs to be TV. He thinks films can go for 10 hours and be on television. He calls... Uh, Perpetual Grace, a 10-hour film. Mm -hmm. And so if that's it's shot that way, I mean, there are moments where I don't know, from what I saw, I didn't know how you would meet a television schedule shooting something the way that this is shot. Yeah, well, like anything that's like y you want to be excellent, you need to prepare for. And so uh, Stephen Conrad and his, his DP, uh, Jimmy Whitaker, beyond prepared for this stuff. He, Jimmy Whitaker shot Patriot, too. Okay. Um, so they would have the most clear and thoughtful filmic compositions, so clear and ready. And they would adjust for things on the day, and they would capture a sunset, because they're always looking for truth. And they use the medium of film for all it's worth. You know, a lot of people, to just set up standard coverage. This is happening, and here's a close-up. They have such wide, they won't move in unless what they're saying, the character is saying, is really, really important. So you'll see on, on Perpetual Grace, sometimes there's shots where the people are this big, and all you're seeing is the expanse of um, Santa Fe, and that character itself, and the huge sky weighing down on this character. That's all planned. Which they say you're not supposed to do in television. I mean, I, we were talking about this in the green room. We were talking about the way that this is shot, the way that Chernobyl was shot. Um, I would say even sometimes the way that Stranger Things is shot, which are extremely successful television shows that are not shot like TV. Yeah. And I have to watch a lot of TV. When I see a dramatic show that is shot like TV, it generally doesn't pick up. Like, people don't are not attracted to that in a lot of ways. And I don't know if people know exactly what they are and aren't attracted to in terms of filmic style, yeah. but I think there is something about TV needing to be as atmospheric as, you know, when Hollywood movies were great. <laughs> like exactly. Great Hollywood movies. Exactly. Like the 80s and 90s. We have that potential now, and there's a, a few people taking advantage of it and trying to push us past, you know, on one end, we, we're, we're making movies on TV. On the other end, if you look at the content, it's, it's like just versions of perfect strangers, like endless versions of simple sick. I mean, I, I, love, I did love perfect strangers at the time. Love the intro. I'm good. Love the yeah, intro. Exactly. Uh, when they go in the revolving door mm -hmm. and get stuck. It's mm -hmm. one of so the good. funniest things. Running to the stadium. Oh, Balky. Yeah, Balky. Sweet, sweet Balky. And the dance of joy. Um, but... <laughs> Because that stuff is so immediately consumable. And I mean, come on, we all like to watch a little trash, especially with a long goddamn day. You're like, oh, I just want to watch Forensic Files. Or, you know, or, or, or just <laughs> no Friends trash. reruns. Well, it is because... American I was, justice. I was, well, I was explaining some with Forensic Files, with everything that's going on with the world right now, nothing is being solved. There's no solutions being made. Yet if you could have a hellish day of work, you see all of the political chaos, and you get home, and like in 30 minutes, I could see a terrible thing happen and know that they'll catch the guy, and then it's done. It's just sad. It's almost like it's, it's a, uh, the lullaby of 2019. Your, wi your wish fulfillment. Exactly. Your wish fulfillment. Just wow. get the bad guy. <laughs> What has it been like? Uh, I mean, this is a uh, uh, working with Ben Kingsley. I mean, yeah. Come on, he he's he's stunning. Everything he's he's everything I've seen him do is at a level that I'll never even conceive of being, much less be. And so, I was 
I was terrified to meet him because I just hold such people that know more than me in such difference, and I want to make sure um, I'm not stepping on their toes, and I'd also like to learn from them. So I, I want to get close, but I don't want to impose. And I, it took me three days to kind of move my chair near his, and he was near the, the heater. It was very, very cold. And I moved it just kind of in the general area, and he's like, oh, come on, come on over here, next to, the, next to the fire. And I brought up Harold Pinter, who's a, a favorite playwright of mine, yeah. Who he know, who who he knew, and um, and then we started talking about the. I told him about some Shakespeare plays I've done, and he told me about the thirteen Shakespeare roles he's done, <laughs> and we just hit it off, man. And he was a peach the entire shoot. He was just so special, and uh, I learned so much from him. he. He came to the read through. So before we do. Uh, uh, a series, you do a read-through for the designers like a week before filming, so everyone can get on the same page here at Red Out. He was off book for the read-through, which I've never seen before. And when you're that good, there, there's, there's this thing that happens sometimes where you've been validated so much that you start to believe it's just inherent in you, this quality in you is just inherent. And I've seen brilliant actors prepare less and less as time goes on. And he's doing the opposite. Well, the reason that brilliant actors prepare less and less as time goes on is because I think that actor, and I feel so bad for them sometimes, because you, as an actor, when you start, you think that you have to prepare for everything and make it the best that it can possibly be. You go shoot this movie, you walk away from it being like, I worked so hard on that, that's going to be the shit, people are going to love it, and then it bombs and it's a terrible movie. And then you go to do something that you think is probably garbage and you're just collecting a check, and then it goes and makes $200 million and wins an Oscar or something. Like, you really just have no control. So I totally understand when I hear of older actors who are kind of like, just hit your mark, do your thing, Whatever happens, happens. Exactly. Exactly. Or 100%. But, and then there's also the element of um, they like this. Yeah. This, this is, I'm, I'm now convinced that what I'm doing, they like. Yep. And you, you forget that, well, they liked it back then because you, were, you cared so much. And, and yes, your quali the quality of having you on film, that's, that's something. But when you were an amazing artist, that was because of the work you were doing on your craft not just your face and your, your, your tone and all the things that you do. And, and Sir Ben Kingsley hasn't relaxed one iota about how much he loves you the You call him sir? Actually. I mean, I, 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 I do. He didn't demand it or anything. But he didn't stop you. <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't. But. Yeah. Uh, please, I wouldn't either. Uh, yeah, no, and, and I think he deserves it, you know? And so I, I, I just, I call him Sir Ben. I call him Sir Ben. Uh, and Jackie Weaver as well, who's just so wonderful. She's, you know, it's been amazing to watch her develop an American career after Animal Kingdom. Mm -hmm. That's a great Australian How cool movie. is that? Yeah, so cool because she's amazing in that movie, but nobody knew who she was in the States. In the States. Prior, yeah. prior to that, and now she is kind of like a beloved actress I in the know. United States. I know. She was uh, one of the actors most people were excited that I was going to get to work with, including myself. Um, and uh, she, she, was, she had a pop like singing career in Australia. She was just a star already before the rest of us discovered over here in our little country. Wow. Yeah. You have a wonderful uh, scene with her, a number of them, but one of them that I really loved in the pilot where she's listing all of the different types of drugs at, drug addicts that she has worked with, and it's just like, some of them clearly don't actually exist. <laughs> They're just like, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a riff on that sort of old school taxi driver, uppers, downers, exactly. smack, yes. like whatever you need. Uh, what was it like doing that scene with her? Uh, hilarious, um, endearing. Like she listed the list of drug addicts she's she's taken care of before, and it sounds like she loved each one, right. despite being a squeaker, popper, dipper. Um, yeah, <laughs> other made up druggy druggy names. Uh, we have time for a couple questions from the audience. Who has nice. a question? Right here. Hey, sir. All right, now I was I was waiting all night to ask this question. I'm oh so, my God! Yo, yo, like you are an incredible actor. I saw Unsolved, and you played uh, Russell Poole. Yes, sir. And my question is, how did you actually prepare yourself mentally to play that? Because before you answer, when you fell out that chair, 
that it was incredible. Like <laughs> it was, it was incredible. But it was like I, I, I just, I just want to know your, your answer. I'm, I'm you just gave me chills. Right just, thank you for, thank you for watching that show. Um, that show uh, I love so much. Um, being able to play uh, Russell Poole was something I took so seriously because he's this one cop from LAPD that knew shit wasn't getting done. He knew the LAPD wasn't on top of it and he was trying to propel them. And he was so loud. And in the ensuing years, he passed away, I think in 2015. In the ensuing years, nobody believed him. So once he was out of the cops, once the journalists stopped paying attention, he fell in with you know some conspiracy theorists. And his message got muddied up along the way. And he, his name isn't that crystal clear. And my goal was to show the man at the time who was trying to, to help had nothing but love and investment in it. And because he had recently passed, and, and I knew his son just through um, the media, his son was kind of unsure about who's gonna, how they're gonna make his dad look now, you know? And I had whiteboards, uh, three of them in my home, with every fact about what had happened on, on uh, during in Tupac and Biggie and their murders. And so I needed to get so close, like halfway through the, through the first episode, I realized, oh, I can't just act this. I need to know this so much better than I thought I had to do for to prepare. And I worked so hard. And then with the heart attack, um, I researched heart attacks and I called my father who had a really severe heart attack. And I brought together kind of uh, my interpretation of how to show, given everything my father told me and everything I read about what it, the experience of a heart attack is. And, and so I'm beyond prepared for that scene that you just referenced. And it was so important to me to get right that whole role and that moment because of the respect for Russell Poole and what he was trying to do. And I got a message from his son, Kurt, with a thumbs up saying, thank you. Thank you for showing my dad like that. Thanks for saying that, man. Uh, I want to ask you about another uh, project, which is a movie that came out this year that uh, no one did any press for, really, so I didn't get to talk to anybody for it, but uh, I love the film so much, and that's Under the Silver Lake. I knew you were going to say that. Love that Because you have tastes that uh, go beyond what everyone is talking about when it's, it, there's actually artistry involved, and the, 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 the movie hasn't gotten much press. There's like a small crew of film critics who champion it, and love it. And I think part of that reason is because it got kind of dumped and it didn't seem like anybody knew what to do with it. Right. And we were all kind of like, no, this is actually like in a lot of ways, a masterpiece about fandom and about conspiracy theories mm -hmm. and about sort of, uh, American men, like yeah. the lazy yes. American male being seduced and consumed with, uh, a means to explain their own sort of poor, poor dealings with mm -hmm. the world. Um, and Andrew Garfield was at the top of his game yeah. showing that spoiled, a man that's pushed by all these different things, just kind of lurking around, moved by everybody else's impulses. I think people didn't really know how to deal with a main character like that. I thought people didn't really know how to deal with the fact that I wore women's blouses in all three <laughs> scenes I was in. At first I was like, maybe that's gonna draw people. And then I was like, maybe it's me. Uh, no, but- uh, yeah, Your decision, did you choose to wear women's blouses? No, I, I wish, I wish. No, he, that was the director and he's like, I think, I think you wearing women's blouses? Just I was like, ooh, what's that about? He's like, I just think it's a thing for your character. <laughs> I'm like, I will make it so. Do you, when a director brings something like, or asks for something like that, do you ask questions about it usually? Or are you like, no, that's what the director wants me to do, and like, I'll um, figure out a way to make it work for myself. I, I love deferring to people who are professional in their craft. So I have my own process. Of course, if something completely doesn't make sense, but I'm not an actor that's like, wait, hold on, why would that happen? Because I feel like I'd have my phone in my back pocket. And like, I don't have any of those. I won't, I won't do that. I, I, like to, I like to be given a jungle gym to play on, a very specific jungle gym, and then I'll do my thing once you tell me exactly what you're looking for. Right. So no, uh, you know, my uh, Stephen Conrad said to me on, on Perpetual Grace, he called me up, before a, an episode shooting and said, would you drive a car on camera across the street and then through the plate glass window of a car dealership? And I was like, hell yeah, <laughs> hell yes, sir. And, and I did it, I did it. Um, was it fun? 
Oh gosh, it was so fun and nerve wracking, and I was because uh, it's it's a whole different craft stunts than than my job is to stay in the moment of fantasy so that you guys can believe that it's real, and so that's just the that's my process. When I'm driving a car that I need to go be going 23 miles an hour, cross over this median, drive through these this much space, there's two actors in a car opposite me inside the thing, so I can't go past this mark. Uh, it's a whole nother ball of wax, um, but I loved it. And it's I also probably hard to stay in the moment when there's got to be a small part of you that is sitting there thinking like. I'm in a TV show. Like I'm actually getting to be in a TV show or something like yeah. you've acted in all these things. But when a moment like that comes, you really recognize the entire pretend and the life that you are living at this point. That is a keen observation, man. I, I, I wouldn't have summed it up that way, but that's how I should. That's exactly that. That experience was well, completely there because it's a job and yeah. we all have jobs. But every now and then, like the job suddenly opens itself up to you and you go, this is crazy that I get to do this. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I actually thought I've ne I don't I'm not a like a much phone on the set kind of guy, but I brought my phone to the car thinking I need to record myself doing this. <laughs> I need I just need to sh so I can see it and feel awesome later. And then um I, I, I aborted because I just felt like I'll be thinking about that and I have so much to yeah. think about. So I, I threw it on the seat. But uh I it was weird. I I couldn't not act. Because I knew I was on camera and I knew it you can't see me. It's so distant, but I, I knew I was on camera. And so uh, my guy is actually in a, in a fugue, and he's just driving because he's driving. He's not looking at his speed limit. He's not looking at where the space is. So I just fugued out once I was on the thing, and I went over speed a little bit, and they needed a, a curb to stop me. But I made the mark, <laughs> and I didn't hurt anybody. That's also muscle memory, though. Someone called action, and you there's no way that you cannot... Yeah. Do the job that you've been doing now for, you know, 15, 20 years. Yeah. How long? 15, 20. 20. Yeah, 20 yeah. years. Yeah. Uh, one more question. Hey, um, hey, man. I don't know if this is working. I think it is. I don't know if no. mine is. Uh, you were talking about earlier about playing weird characters, and I'm a huge It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia fan. Hell yeah, man. Um, some of my favorite episodes have had the McPoyles in them, and uh -oh. I know that's a show where you guys get to improv a lot. So I want to know if A, you had a favorite episode that you were in, and B, if there was a line, like a favorite improv line that it was yours. Favorite, favorite episode that I was in, is, is, were you asking? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, when uh, Liam McPoyle gets married, <laughs> um, there's, there's, there's a couple moments that I just, because they, they're so hilarious, uh, Charlie and Robin, Glenn, and, and all their writers. And so the fact that I got to play um, Liam McPoyle um, smiling about his upcoming nuptials and my idea was like I'm going to make it the smile look like he's never s honestly smiled before and I wanted people to kind of hear tendons cracking that have never been used so it's and uh, uh, and uh, also uh, I think an improv that I'm I'm, I'm pretty proud of is it's, it's one word with a hyphen and it was um, Fork stabbed. You get fork stabbed, Charlie. Um, just because it lands and it, it's so McPoyle, and I do have people yell, fork stabbed at me across the street. Um, I have people sending me glasses of milk at bars. Um, you always wonder where they got the milk in a dive bar, but still, I don't, I don't drink it. But yeah, man, good call. Do you keep up with the show when you're not on it? Do you watch Sunny? Yeah, I, I mean, I watch Sunny. Sunny's on the top of my list. I don't get to watch too much television, but I'm always watching many episodes each. Did each you get season. the chance to catch the last season's finale with Rob doing the dance, Matt oh, doing God. the dance, and beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Um, my my wife Sophia is a ballet. Uh, she, she did ballet for the first twenty years of her life, and um, she when she I, we went to a thing with Rob, and she just couldn't stop singing his praises at how beautiful <laughs> his work is. It's a really is. beautiful sequence, yeah. It's gorgeous. I mean, he's, he, he's amazing, too. He, he commits to so much, whether it's gaining the weight. When he wants to do something, he does it. And, and even that look, that kind of like slapdash feel of that show, that's all Rob's, that's his goal. Make it feel lived in, make it feel comfy, make it feel familiar, and he, he won't break that. So... It just takes a it's a it's a creator with vision and you're gonna get something great. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I think as you guys did with Perpetual Grace Limited. I can't wait to watch the rest of it. Uh, Jimmy, I love having you here. It's I so much fun to talk to you. Thank you, man. Uh, the show is on Epic Sunday nights at 10 p.m. It sure is. Jimmy Simpson, everybody. Let's hear Thank it. Thank you guys for having me. Appreciate it. 